All right, I think we've officially shut out the other side, so we can, we can get started now. Um, welcome to the advanced side, uh, where we're going to talk about HTML5 and SEO in WordPress development, formerly HTML5 and CSS3 uh, in WordPress development. So although we are on the advanced side, I'm like the remedial part of the advanced side. So I'm going to talk about some basics of, of uh, or some fundamentals of SEO with WordPress, uh, and then my colleague Brian Whaley is going to come and talk about HTML5. So, if you, you know, I figure there's probably varying degrees of, of uh, experience in the room dealing with uh, SEO and WordPress. So, um, you know, if you know this stuff, then just zone out, and I'll let you know when Brian's about to start talking. Um, all right. So, fundamentals of WordPress and SEO. So, we're going to talk basically on uh, proper on-page SEO with WordPress. Um, so, we'll talk a little bit about keywords, because it doesn't matter how well you optimize your site, if you don't have any keywords on it, you're not going to get any traffic. Uh, and then we'll talk about just kind of like on-page SEO elements, page titles, URL, headers, meta description, meta keywords. Um, so this is an example of one of the websites uh, that I run on WordPress uh, for the A3C Hip Hop Festival, which is a hip hop festival down in Atlanta, held annually. So this is the one, the website I'm going to use is kind of my example website. So the three most important pieces of on-page SEO are the page title, which in a browser displays up at the top, um, the URL, and specifically like the, the pretty permalink part of the URL, so everything after the slash, um, and then the H1 tag. So in this case, the H1 tag is the, the actual title of this blog post. Um, so when it comes to like actually pulling in traffic, like the way that, the way that Google or Yahoo or Bing um, whoever ends up indexing a page, these are the three places that, that those search engines look at first to determine how they're going to index a page and what words they're going to index a page for. Um, so whatever you're trying to rank for, um, th this is where you want to get those keywords in. And of course, be realistic when you're trying to rank for keywords, because if you try to rank for something like software, you're, you're just not going to be able to do it. But like in our case, like the strategy for this website is basically we write about the hip hop artists that um, like our fans are interested in, right? So we're not going to rank for like the roots because they're too big of a group for us. To, we're not going to rank number one for the roots, but we could rank number one for like the roots featuring John Legend and B.O.B. the Fire Remix, right? Which is what this blog post is about. So that's where we want to make sure that's the keyword that we're we're trying to get, which is a long tail keyword, and we're putting it in those three places. Um, all right, so to make it really simple. Um, you you all ideally want those three keywords, the, the same keyword to be in those, to appear in, in all three of those places. Um, and to make it really simple for the people who are actually writing for your blog, um, you want to make it so that all you have to do is write a title of a blog post, make sure the keywords show up in the title, and then make sure that those keywords appear in all three of those places. So there's the blog post title, or there's a blog post name. This is getting cut off a little bit, but so by default, um, like when you you know if you just set up a WordPress blog, by default WordPress is going to display the page title as uh, the the name from the general settings, the disc like from the blog name in the general settings, followed by the title of the blog post. Um, ideally, that's not what you want because if you have a like a name for your blog or for your website that's longer than seventy characters. Google is never going to make it past the name of your blog to see the keywords that you have in the blog post title. So you want to flip that around and make sure that the blog post title is showing up before the name of the actual blog or the name of the website. So in this case, like this is kind of the, the code that default, like by default shows up. And then this here is the code that you want to change it to. So you're, you're basically flipping around the PHP, or you're basically flipping around WP underscore title and putting that in the front. And then in my case, since I wanted to add this, since I wanted to add this pretty little pipe here, um, I just added in the pipe as the separator and then made sure that it, it showed up on the on the right hand side of the of the post. Does that make sense for everybody? Um, all right, next, you always want to use pretty permalinks. Yeah, go ahead. Was that WordPress 2 or 3? What does that matter? Uh, WordPress 2. I haven't updated to WordPress 3 yet. So. I wonder if WordPress How many people here have updated to WordPress 3? Okay. 
I think it's it, it should it should be exactly the same. same. Okay. Yeah, at, at least as far as I know. I'll find out once I actually do the update and all my page titles get screwed up. But I think I think it should be exactly the same. You can quote me on that. Um, all right. So pretty permalinks. How many people are using pretty permalinks? <coughs> how many people are not? Okay. So by default, when you're like, how many people are, are how many people have like are using like WordPress like on their own domain? So they actually have like like a MySQL database set up. Okay. Um, so by default, when you set up WordPress on your own domain, you get one of these kind of like the WordPress is going to try to give you URLs that look like this top one, right? Where you just have like like each post that you write has like a number associated with it. Um, search engines don't like that. Search engines want to see a keyword rich post title, right? Down here at the bottom. Um, so the way that you can make sure that that shows up is by going into your settings and then going to permalinks and making sure that you turn on pretty permalinks. Um, and what I usually recommend, oops, what I usually recommend is using the uh, post name, right? But if you wanted to, you could use like category and post name. Um, but if you just use like this code for post name with the little percentage signs on either side of it, um, that is going to give you like the, the proper post name. And then you're making sure that the post name is matching the page title, right? So now we've got two out of three. Um, and then finally, you want to make sure that your, the, your H1 tag also displays the title of the blog post or the, the title of the page that you're looking at, right? So most of the time, if you're using like a good WordPress theme, like how many people here like built their own WordPress theme from scratch? How many people are using a theme that they got from someone else and then messed around with it? Yeah, that's, that's me as well. So depending on who you get a theme from, you all, the first thing you want to do if you're using somebody else's theme and messing with it is making sure that they actually have the title of your post displayed as the H1 tag, right? Sometimes, I mean, if they have it displayed as the H2 tag, it's not that bad because like, you, you want it to be a header. But sometimes they'll just use like a span or something and, and put in the title in some sort of like paragraph span with custom like, settings associated with it and it won't show up as the H1 tag. And what search engines want to see is they want to see that H1 tag actually showing up on the page. Right? So in this case, by changing the page title um, and making sure that your blog post title comes first in the page title, by changing the URL to use pretty permalinks, and again, making sure that the blog post title shows up as the full permalink of, of the post, and then making sure that you've got an H1 class on your title um, showing up at the top of the post, you're, you're doing pretty good from an SEO standpoint. Um, meta description, this is kind of the most complicated part. Um, so your meta description is important, not really for, for SEO, like from an SEO standpoint, because search engines don't really, like you don't want to just pack your meta description with keywords, because search engines don't really put much relevant, uh, like on the words in your uh, meta description from like an SEO standpoint. Uh, but the reason that meta description is still important is that meta description shows up uh, underneath your like text in a Google search or a Bing search or a Yahoo search, right? So this is the, the link up here that I'm using. Like this is the link to the actual page that I'm ranking for in Google. And underneath, this is the meta description. So by default, WordPress just uses the blog info description. So that's when you go into like general settings and you say like, you know, what's your blog about? And you say like my blog's about sandwiches or you know, like whatever your blog happens to be about. Um, as the, the default meta description for every single page, right? So right now, if someone, if someone was doing a search for the roots and John Legend, and they found, you know, my, my blog post came up for it, let's say, but then they read the description, and the description underneath didn't mention anything about the roots or John Legend or BOB, it just said like, you know, the A3C Hip Hop Festival is a three day hip hop festival held annually in Atlanta. It's gonna, they're probably not gonna click on me. They're probably gonna click on somebody else who actually looks like they're more relevant to the content that they were searching for. So ideally what you want to do is make sure that your meta description shows up uh, in like in you know like on your when you look when you're looking at like the single.php page, you want to make sure that the meta description shows up as something that's relevant to the article. So the way that I went about doing that is um, creating ex excerpts in my blog. So like I'll take I'll, I'll put in some sort of relevant text from the blog post into an excerpt. Um, so in this case, you know, here we're talking about someone who's performed at the A3C, uh, a hip hop artist named B.O.B. Um, you know, so that the excerpt shows up here underneath the, the link to my blog post in a Google search results page, right? 
So this is kind of the most complicated piece of code. Uh, but basically, you want to go in and uh, make it say, so the reason it's complicated is because like this will work really well for pages that have excerpts on it. So like a blog post page has an excerpt, but like a post page has no excerpt, right? Like my home page has no excerpt. So what you want to do is you want to write a piece of code that basically says like, you know, if this is a post, right? So if this is like a single page, um, then you want to display the excerpt, right? If this is my home page, right, which doesn't have any sort of an excerpt on it, then I want to display the uh, description from my settings. Does that make sense? So now if someone comes to my home page, it says the A3C Hip Hop Festival is a three day blah, 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 blah. If someone comes to one of my blog posts, they get, or they're searching for one of my blog posts, they get a little nice piece of information about that blog post. Didn't know I put things in there. Meta keywords don't matter. Uh, which is which is why well, I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, search engines don't really use meta keywords anymore. Uh, that's a little piece of tumbleweed rolling through the desert, and that's kind of where meta keywords stand. So that's kind of that's my part. Does anyone have any questions on that? So with the pretty URLs, does the question mark actually matter there? If it were to say so, in the example you had, you had question mark p equals one two three. If it was question mark p equals Keyword rich post name, right? Would that would that be as effective or less? I think it would, but I don't know why would you add the question. Like if you're using like if you have like the the post name, I mean you could put whatever you want like in front of the post name or after the post name, but so ultimately depending on what your uh, just it depends on whether or not you actually can do the pretty post names. Yeah. Um, because you know you may not have mod rewrite for Apache, right. you may not have various right. other things. That is true. So if there was an alternate way, then it could be faster to set up. Yeah, it could be. Okay, but you, so you don't really know, but it sounds like it would be about the same. Yeah, as long as I mean, what Google's looking for is it's basically scanning the the full URL and it's looking for keywords in the URL that it can derive some sort of meaning from. So like sometimes like if you have like you might have like some parts of it that make sense. Um, and then, but as long as it can find keywords that are actually relevant to that post, it's going to do do good for you. Thank you. Anybody else? You used the term um, Montel keyword, I think. <laughs> yes. And I was just wondering what that was exactly. Like I can guess, but it's a complicated. Uh, well, it's not that complicated. So you have like you have like like a core keyword, right? So like for, for like let's I'll keep using the example of the hip hop festival. So we have like the word like hip hop festival is a word that we would like love to rank for. Um, but like five years ago when we started the hip hop festival, we weren't going to go from like just starting a website to ranking for the word hip hop festival. So instead of going after like basically what's like a high difficulty keyword like hip hop festival, we started going after words that had some sort of variation on them, right? So like maybe like hip hop festival might be too hard for us to rank for because some some bigger better websites out there. But hip hop festival in Atlanta is a word that we could actually start rank, ranking for, right? Or hip hop festival Southeast, or hip hop festival US, right? So they're not exactly the word that we're looking for, but they're basically just variations to that word. Mm -hmm. So you have like the core keyword in that case, which would be hip hop festival, and then you have like a string of like, you know, an infinite number of possible variations to the word hip hop festival that kind of that you could rank for, like that are related to that word. So that infinitely long list is the long tail. And then, like, eight, like hip hop festival is the the um, the core keyword that's kind of like the base of the long tail. Are we good? Cool. All right. So here's so for anyone that was sleeping through that part, you can wake up now and listen to Brian Whaley. Is this on? Okay. Great. This is a small room, so I think you can all hear me anyway. Um, let's get to my part. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about HTML5 and semantic search because they're kind of hot new things that are starting to come out and there's starting to be a lot of buzz around the internet and tech blogs, things like that, especially around HTML5 because it's something that's been kind of a big topic recently. Does everyone in the room know what HTML5 is? Is there anyone who doesn't know what HTML5 is? Good. There's honest people in the crowd. I like that. Um, so what HTML5 is, is the easiest way to start with explaining that is to explain that right now and for about the last... Um, 12, 13 years or so, um, 
almost all of the web has been written in this language called HTML4. Um, and it was version 4 of HTML. Um, and people started to use it around 1996, 1997 to describe how websites should look and feel on the internet. Um, and then around 2007, 2008, people started to realize, especially around the, um, the big companies that have a big stake in the web, like companies like Apple, Adobe, Microsoft, Yahoo, um, every other big company that you can name that has some kind of big stake on how the web works and look what it looks like, um, started to realize that there was kind of a lot of deficiencies in what they wanted to do um, because they were base, basing everything that was on the web around a 20-year-old technology at that point. Um, and so it was time for some new techniques to help them describe the content that was on the internet and how, what it should look like. Um, and so HTML5 is a lot like HTML4. Um, it's those tags that we're used to, like the A tag for creating anchor links or for putting images on things. Um, but it adds a few new tags, um, about 20 of them, um, that do new things from letting people um, easily embed video into pages, something that nobody really was thinking about 15 years ago when things like video on the web were like this total distant vision of something that might happen 10 years from now. Um, uh, ways to easily embed audio on the web, something that was starting to happen 15 years ago, but you know, when most of the world was stuck on, on uh, dial-up internet connections, it wasn't really feasible to put a lot of audio out on the web because very few people could get at it. Um, and then other things were just things that people hadn't thought about 15 years ago um, because search technology was so in the past where they were just trying to scrape keywords off of pages and figure out um, from there, if somebody typed in a search query, what's the best page to return? Um, and what they started to realize about 10 years later is that uh, there was no good way to figure out where the content was on a page if you were the Google or Bing bot that was crawling through the internet looking at pages. How do you know what the most important content is on that page? Um, because you might get confused if it's a really complicated page or a page with a strange layout that you haven't really seen before and think that something that's like in the navigation or in the sidebar or in the footer is the most important content on the page when it's not and you're really looking for that article in the middle of the page. Um, and so I wanted to talk about these eight tags, which are, from the WordPress perspective, the most important eight tags uh, in HTML5. Um, header, footer, um, this H group, which stands for header group, um, navigation, article, section, time, and aside. Um, that might seem like a mumbo jumbo for right, for right now, but I'm going to explain kind of where they are and where they fit into the HTML5 world. Um, so for today's topics around search engine optimization and uh, and WordPress is, I first want to talk about, you know, how as designers or people creating themes or people editing themes, um, as I saw a lot of hands go up for both of those when Andy was talking, uh, how we can incorporate HTML5 to help our themes do better in the future, um, and then how to further optimize our sites so they do better in search engines. Um, so just for an example, this is what a page might look like in HTML4 right here. Um, where we had this thing called a div and we would use it to describe what different parts of our page um, looked like and what they should be designed like. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I should give some credit. I ripped these images blatantly from a list apart, which is a wonderful website if you're not familiar with it, um, for anything related to web technology. Um, but they were such good images that I thought it would be very silly to make my own, and so I wanted to take theirs. Um, but the idea was that every website's gonna have some kind of a header on it, it's gonna have some kind of navigation, and there's going to be articles, and especially in the WordPress world, pretty much every website has some kind of sidebar to it. And then a footer down at the bottom with some more navigation links or author information or something like that. And I wanted to do, the, and so with HTML5, we're doing the same things, except that there's dedicated tags for this now. And what makes this so great compared to this is because if a search engine sees this, it has no idea what this actually is. Um, some people might have called an article an article when they were naming their divs. Or they might have called it like anything else. Or they might have called it Article 3. And the search engine gets confused because it sees the word article in there, but it's not sure, is there an Article 1 I'm looking for? Is there an Article 5? What, what's the most important content on this page that I want to be showing my users? And this makes it really, really explicit to everyone, <coughs> including search engines, that are looking at the code for this page. They're like, ah, there's an article. And I know inside of that article, I'm going to find some content. And there might be an important subsection inside of that article that I need to care about. And there might be this aside here that's like some sidebar information and a link to their Twitter account, but I probably don't really care about that if I'm a search engine because I'm not worried about their link to their Twitter account from this page. Um, and I know where their navigation is and I'm not going to get confused by it. Is your footer 
Sure. Then do you have one two You could do that. Um, and the nice thing about that is because it, they're all article tags, uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit to sh show you like a screenshot of what that might look like. But since they're all article tags, it can tell clearly that they're all articles. So like when you're on your home page, you might have several article tags. Um, you might have like an article inside of an article in some situations even, but that way you, you, know, like you can tell clearly where one article is and where that article ends and the next article begins because it's like this really clear semantic notion of what an article I is on that website. Um, so this is a blog that I run. Um, I try not to take it too seriously, but the idea is that I try to identify the secret lizard people that are scheming to take over our world. Um, I do great for, for uh, search keywords like, is Richard Nixon secretly a lizard person? Things like that. Um, but I wanted to just walk through each one of those tags and where I would be using it um, if I was using HTML5 on this blog that I run. So here, for example, is this H group tag that I talked about very briefly before. Um, every WordPress blog that comes with that default theme with the big blue box at the top says something like, my WordPress blog, just another WordPress site, something like that. And before, there, was, there would be these two headers way up at the top, and there was no way to say uh, in HTML4 that they were closely related and it was like a, head and a headline and a subheadline. There was no way to express that kind of a notion. Um, and now you can say to that search engine, don't worry about this headline. These are together, but it's really just the title of my blog, and you really want to be worried most about this headline here. And this is the header for my blog post, that header tag that we talked about before. And, th that's, and so that way, it can clearly identify what are the most important headlines. And if I had a subheadline on this line here or something like that, so that it can identify like where are my most important headlines on the page, which ones should I group together, which ones should I not worry about too much. Um, and then here's that place where we're I was, when I was talking about that nav tag before, where I could use that nav tag to describe this area, uh, where I've got like my forward and back links on my post that go to like the next post or the last post, or to like the major pages of my WordPress site. Everyone following me so far? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then I've got this big orange box here. And this would be my article. Uh, so it's got my image in here. Uh, it has a like a quote that I pulled in from somewhere else, and then it has some text around it. And the idea is. I'm telling that search engine, or that Bing bot that comes through, or that Google bot that comes through, that this is one article, and I want you to look at all of this content together. And then there might be another article below that, like you mentioned, but, uh, but it's a separate article, and so I don't want you to get confused about what parts of my page are the most important, or the second most important, or whatever. Um, there's also this tag called a section tag, which you can use to call out a specific section of an article if there's something that you think is really important. Um, and usually these are, like parts of a blog post that would have their own subheadline under them. Um, so for example, I have a quote from an email that someone sent me here. Um, that could be a section because I want to call out that I've got this, this quote that I'm pulling in from somewhere else that isn't part of the main body of my article, but it's still really important to me there. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, or for people who are writing long blog posts that are kind of more like essays or something like that, um, like a lot of columnists and tech writers like to do, um, this way you can, uh, you know, they, they can build each of their points separately and say, you know, here's one section of my blog post, here's another section, and they can style them slightly differently if they want to. Um, and then finally down here I have my footer where I've got like my published date and my uh, category tags and things like that, um, and places where you can sign up for my RSS feed. Um, and then there's one more tag that I use down here um, where the date is, where you can, where there's now a date tag and the great thing about that is now a search engine can tell definitively when a piece of content was published. Um, say you're like most websites on the internet and Google or Bing or Yahoo, they only really come by your website once every three or four weeks to see if you're, you've published new content. Um, now they know definitively when did that piece of content come into existence. Uh, and uh, that way when they're presenting semantic information in their web searches or something, they can say definitively. You know, where did this come from? When did it come into being? Um, and what should I think about it next? And then over here, like I mentioned earlier, we have this aside tag. Um, so what do we need to know? Semantic search is coming. Um, I'm about to provide a great example of it. And as developers or designers or people who are interested in development and design, um, we want to know about this stuff. We want to be aware of it. Um, and our customers or our users or whoever we're marketing whatever we work on to, 
um, even if it's just ourselves, um, we, want to, they, we want them to know about it too because it makes them appreciate us that much more because they don't have to think about it that way. Um, one of the big questions, especially when you're replacing uh, any you know, 20 year old, 15 year old piece of technology is how does it work with older pieces of technology? What about those people out there that are using like Internet Explorer 6 still from 2001 or people who are using Firefox 2 from you know, six years ago as well? Um, what about them? The good news about HTML5 is that they, since it was 2006, 2007, when they started to come up with this, um, they thought about that for a while because they already knew that there was lots of people, even in 2006, that were using browsers from the late 90s or early 2000s when they had bought that first family computer or something like that. Um, and so they planned for it to, to work backwards pretty gracefully um, so that if a browser didn't know what a section tag was, that it would still do roughly the appropriate thing. Um, and this works pretty well except in, in older versions of Internet Explorer like IE7, um, but there's a really great workaround from that for that, which is nice. Um, and one example of this uh, is that if IE7 and 8 uh, see a, uh, an HTML element like a section tag that they don't recognize, that they're not aware of, it won't render any of the CSS stylings that you provide with that, that tag. And so that could give you some funny looking pages. Um, but there's a nice workaround with that where an element that's inserted via JavaScript um, with just like a single line of JavaScript saying uh, I've got an article tag and I want you to understand that there's this new element, you've never heard of it before, it's an article tag, um, apply those stylings to it um, and, and, it'll, and Internet Explorer will then say, oh, I see that you've introduced me to a new tag, thank you, I'm going to now render that cleanly for you. Um, and so there's a great script by a guy named Remy Sharp, um, and we can send around the slides afterwards, and I have some links to some cool articles, and his script in particular, that it's just one line of code that you can add to the top of your website or to the, into your HTML header in WordPress. Um, it's pretty easy to do, and the nice thing is that every time one of your pages gets loaded, um, it'll automatically reintroduce it to all of those tags, so that, that way you can use HTML free, HTML5 freely, and you don't have to worry about uh, about Internet Explorer's older versions getting caught up on the, those new, uh, newer elements. Um, and if this has already been fixed in the beta versions of IE9, where if it encounters an element that it's not familiar with, uh, it, it'll still render all the styles properly, even if, it doesn't, if it's not sure what else to do with that. Um, any questions about this so far? Good. Does IE9 support HTML5? Yes, definitely. Uh, and IE8 has some support for HTML5, but uh, it doesn't support some of the, the newer elements like, uh, like section tags and aside tags. Um, but IE9A supports all the tags that I've talked about today um, and has much better support for the tags it doesn't know about yet. Um, so just to reiterate, replacing layered divs like those, like div class equals something, um, with, with coherent like article section related tags so that ev everything is clear where it belongs and what part of the body of the page it is. Um, but then these semantic tags can give search engines inside info into what's on your page and what the most important parts of it and kind of that metadata about your page. So a search engine can clearly tell, you know, what's the main article, what's the important information, what's the header, when was it published, who's the author, things like that. Um, so here's an example of if you type in, in uh, Google or Bing's screenshot from Bing of uh, the Terminator, you get this comes back right at the top where it has things from IMDb and it's got this user rating and the, and the genre and then how long it is. Um, and how did Bing know how to do this? Um, uh, lots of people look for IMDb every day. They're looking at movie reviews, they're looking up you know, quotes, things like that from their favorite movies. Um, and so, you know, Microsoft and Google does this too in, in Google, where uh, they kind of special case IMDb, where they say, you know, there's this regular format to every IMDb movie page, uh, where, you know, there's a director tag here, and it tells you who the director of the movie or the TV show was, uh, how long it is, uh, what the user rating is, and it's a very kind of uniform look to the page. And so for uh, Bing, uh, I can, for, for IMDb, excuse me. I can know exactly all these cr critical information about it and I can get it from there. Um, 
This doesn't work yet, but this is the kind of thing that we're going to start seeing in the future with HTML5, where you can define things like, when was this article published in my blog? Um, who was the author? Um, and how many comments are there on it? Because those comments might be inside their own article tag or their own section tag, um, since they would have probably like some kind of subject line or header on them. Um, they can get a very coherent idea of how many comments are on this blog, so that, for example, uh, it can, when Google or Microsoft gets to that blog page, they can say, oh, this is a WordPress blog. I know what WordPress blogs look like. I know how to count how many comments are on them. I know how to find out the date that it was published, that sort of information. And so that at some point in the future, we, we can start getting things where we have this meta description here. Um, this great blog article by a guy named Nicholas Gallagher about how to start creating basic HTML5 themes in WordPress. Um, but it knows you know, critical information about that blog post, like when it was published and how many comments he received for that blog post. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that if we start to think about this now and produce themes that incorporate this now, we'll be paying off for us in the long run because then our themes will be out there um, or our WordPress plugins will be out there and so that when people are Googling for our, or binging for or whatever for our, uh, our, our customers' blog posts that they'll be getting this critical information back in the search results rather than never knowing from, you know, if this wasn't here, you wouldn't be able to tell me when that, uh, when that blog post came out. Um, or you wouldn't be able to tell me who it was by, except maybe you would know from the domain name of the blog or something like that. Um, so here's another example of a blog post from that blog, uh, where we have the sidebar, we have the nav up at the top, and here's what it looks like in HTML4. Um, and just as an example of how messy this can look, and as Andy said, you know, here's my, uh, my blog post um, subject line in an H2, Here's the H1 for my page, somewhere up here. Um, but I've got two headers on this page. How does you know, Bing know which one is the most important one? Or how does Google know which one's the, you know, the, the one that's for this entry? It has to guess. Luckily, WordPress is pretty well known. It's pretty good at guessing. You know, if I'm searching through this website and I see the same, sub, the same header coming up at the top over and over and over again, that's probably the one that's for that domain and not the one that's for that specific blog post. Uh, so they're getting pretty good at guessing, but we can save them a lot of work, and that'll become important uh, in the next thing that I'm about to get to after this. Uh, but here's an example of that blog post I talked about. Uh, I'm sorry it's a little washed out, but this is that blog post by Nicholas Gallagher about how to write a, a WordPress HTML5 theme. And so we can see this cool stuff down here where he has this article tag, and here's my main article, here's the time that it was published, um, and then the actual printed time so that us humans can read it. Um, and then here, here's the end of my header. My header includes this important information like who I am, what the name of my post is, and when it was published. And then I can have inside of this paragraph that the actual body of my post. But the idea here is that he can save everybody a lot of work and make to search engines it, it abundantly clear what the name of his blog post is and what the name of, uh, and when it was published. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. So I want to get on to the second half of this now, which is, uh, in my opinion, the two most often factors, uh, often missed factors in, in search engine optimization. Um, these are the things like, wh when you're done with optimizing your keywords and things like that, here's the, here's the next step that you can do when you're ready for it. And it's to think about page load time and page render time. Um, and to be a little bit oversimplistic about it, um, say you're a search engine and you make money off of serving the best search results possible to as many people as you possibly can. Um, if a page takes a really long time to load, it's probably not a website you want to spend a lot of time on because your time's really precious to you. And so you want to move from website to website as quickly as you can while not missing anything. But if there's a website that takes a really long time to serve information to you, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to spend a total of two minutes looking at pages on this website and then from there, I'll move on to the next website. Um, and so you want to get the most out of that two minutes that you possibly can. And if all your pages are taking 30 seconds to load, you're going to be pretty unhappy because you know, Google or Bing is going to give up after four or five pages. Um, whereas if your pages were loading in a couple of seconds, it could probably get to your whole website before it said, OK, it's time to move on to the next one. And so one way that once you've done that preliminary level of you know, optimize it for keywords and, and the stuff that Andy talked about. 
here's the, ne the next step is to make sure that your website loads really fast and really cleanly so that they can see as much as of your website before they get tired and go to the next one. Um, so the key is to keep it really simple. Um, a lot of blogs that I see uh, out there right now have, you know, they'll have huge image headers across the top. They'll have some really gorgeous photos in their blog posts. And those are really nice, but it gives them a lot of trouble when, you know, every user to their website is downloading these for like 400 kilobyte images and spending 15 seconds doing it and eating up into all that indexing time that they could have had, you know, spent on getting to another post that was down the page or something like that. Um, and so there's some good ways to um, look at exactly what on your WordPress site is taking the most time to load. Um, the free tools, there's one built into pretty much every major browser that's out there. Um, and what it basically does is it, you load your page with it running and it tells you, uh, you know, what on your page took what amount of time to load. Say, oh, that took 17 milliseconds, that took two seconds, that took 37 milliseconds, et cetera. Um, in Firefox, it's called the net function inside of Firebug. Um, in IE, it's called the profiler, and in Safari, it's called the timeline. But it can really help you pinpoint kind of where are your trouble positions. Do you have some image on your homepage that you don't you know, think about all that often that's really big and is taking up an inordinate amount of time on, on your website? You know, this can really save you some time and get you some more index pages out of it. Um, and this, this can also happen a lot with JavaScript, from, uh, especially ones that you're embedding from other websites, because if that other website is running slowly, that means all the JavaScript that they're serving out to those people is really slow as well. Um, and this is especially, I hate to rag on them too much, but like Facebook is the worst offender I see of this, um, <laughs> where they give out this Facebook Connect code, then they try to make it really sexy and get everybody to put it all over their website, so then Facebook is watching what you do on every website um, and gets to serve you all this great content. Um, but then when you, if you run like that profiler tool or the, uh, the timeline tool against it, um, you'll see that like that, that uh, Facebook widget in the bottom right corner ended up taking seven seconds to load. Now, if you were the Bing bot and you were waiting seven seconds for every page to finish loading, you'd probably get pretty fed up a lot faster than you would otherwise. Um, and so I know that they're really popular and I know that they're uh, you know, a very hot thing in, in you know, getting people to find out about your blog, but there's something that I usually tell like my clients at HubSpot to uh, be careful with because if you put it on every page, that means every page is gonna be taking seven seconds longer to load. And if you have 300 pa pages that you care about, like ranking for different keywords, uh, you're going to be getting yourself into a pretty tough spot pretty quickly with that. Um, so it's popular, but you know, make sure that you're using them in a reasonable way and a reasonable amount, um, and to be careful about you know, watch your page load times with those profiler tools. And if you see that they're getting just too high up there, you might be losing out on some of those index pages that uh, would otherwise be ranking for keywords for you. Um, Images, just really quickly. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there are websites out there with like three or 400 kilobyte header images at the top that are beautiful, but you can get into trouble with those as well when they take a few seconds to download. Um, so th think about ways that you could save some space on them. A lot of the times that people will save them as JPEG format, um, which is great, especially for photos, but it can get you into some trouble because it tends to be result in really big files, um, especially if you have like high resolution photos or something like that. Um, and unless you're in a business where that you really need that kind of like high resolution photo, like if you're a photographer, obviously you care about that. Um, but for most people, especially for things like headers, things like that, um, you can stick with the ping format, um, which especially for like computer generated graphics or images will be much, much smaller and load much more quickly. Um, sometimes uh, it can be up to, you know, a, a third or half is the size of that JPEG um, and look almost exactly the same, if not exactly the same. Um, and every modern image editor out there, like GIMP or um, Photoshop or whatever you have, can export to both of these formats. And so it's just worth, like, when you're looking at your website through that timeline or profiler tool, to look at, you know, are there big images on my website that are the JPEG format that don't need to be in a JPEG format? It, will I save bandwidth on them if I rewrite them into ping um, and re-upload them to my website and make that change? Um, can save you some real load time on your websites. Any questions? Um, Facebook and Twitter are kind of notorious, especially when they're having a slow day, because uh, if Facebook's having a bad day, it means that the JavaScript that they're serving is probably also going to give you a bad day. Um, 
I don't have anything come to mind. Do you any notorious offenders that you can think of otherwise? I know that there's others out there. I can't think of any other. Those are the two like notorious ones that I see over and over again. Oh, yeah. Um, I th yeah, it, it could be taking a while, especially you have a lot of them on a lot of different pages. Um, I don't know particularly like how big it is, how like advanced they've made it so that it can load quickly, or how search engine bots will handle that. Um, that's a good one. I hadn't thought about the Flickr. Um, and the, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they'll just see the flash object and skip over it, or what they'll do with it um, when they're crawling. I think they just skip over. I think they skip over. Yeah. Also, the flash object is more effective. Yeah, most search engines, and they're starting to change away from this and starting to try to index into flash. Um, but as far as I know, most of the time they just like they don't even load it. They're like, oh, it's a flash object. I can't really see what's inside of it. I'm just gonna skip over it for now and uh, and move on. Um, but don't don't quote me on that one. But I believe that's the way it is. Any other questions? I thought I saw another hand. Uh, yeah, uh, do you use uh, CSS sprites to come back on uh, HTTP requests at all? Definitely, that's a good way to do it if you have the time and the know-how. Right. Um, and there's some other cool things you can do with that. Um, like for example, just something that just kind of came to mind was that uh, uh, Nike, in their email marketing that they send out to like their potential customers and everything, um, th they know that everybody has their email set to load with images off by default. And so they came up with this CSS sprite of the Nike swoosh and put it at the top of all the emails. So even if you don't have the images loading, um, you still get like the Nike swoosh at the top of your email. And you're like, oh, it's Nike. I'm going to check out whatever they're trying to sell me right now. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff to do that you can do there, definitely. There's one more back there. Do you have a question? Um, absolute versus relative paths request mm -hmm. affect load time. And what I've been struggling with is trying to change absolute paths yeah. Um, I don't think they'll have any impact on load time, but the relatives paths are definitely a lot better once you get there for other reasons, just because of, uh, you know, if you ever want to move hosts or change your domain name or do any of those other things, it'll save you so much work. Uh, a, a, a quick flick of the switch or something that, that can be done to override the defaults of absolute. I don't know. Anybody else know? I'm not sure. I'm no. Sure yeah. Uh, you can. You'll have to go to, to, to the back end database actually. Yeah. And run an update query. So you have to know SQL. Yeah. Or know somebody who knows SQL. <laughs> 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 and that would be dangerous. Yeah. Just <laughs> 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 back up before you do it. Um, and so, like you were just saying, uh, there's a couple other tricks that you can look at as well. Um, I talked about JavaScript a little bit already, um, but you can also look at optimizing your CSS um, so that it'll just reduce the size of your style sheet to the minimum amount of size and take out all that white space and other things that humans need to read CSS well and to understand what's in it, um, but can cut it down because the computer doesn't care how much white space you have or you know if you have every part of your style explicitly defined. Um, this way you can just save a little bit of, of bandwidth on sending those style sheets, especially if you have a really big style sheet. Um, I've seen some big websites, some big WordPress blogs that have been around for a while, and they're supporting like older versions of some posts that were on their old theme, and they couldn't get them to update correctly, that end up having like this one megabyte CSS file that's getting loaded every time the, the, uh, the uh, Google or Bing bot is hitting their website. It was absolutely brutal. Um, but they were able to cut off like half of that size once they um, started going to, you know, there's, this, there's the file that the developer keeps on his machine, for when he needs to make changes or add something, and then he would compress it every time using this tool that I'll show you guys in a second. Um, that would cut out all of the extra code in there and all the white space and everything, and save them a ton of space. So, you know, 500 kilobytes is still pretty bad, but it wasn't nearly as bad as what they were trying to deal with before. Um, and to use server-side caching when when possible. Um, if you have a WordPress site that has a lot of like dynamic content on it, like a lot of JavaScript or something else, or a lot of Ajax in there for some form or something that you're using. Um, caching can be tough. Uh, you can get into some funky situations. Um, but if you're just using like, if you're just using it for like a simple blog that's attached to a website, um, or it's your entire website, um, caching can really be the way to go. 
um, especially for that day that you get discovered by the internet and 10,000 people try to hit your website at once and take it down. Um, caching can really save you a lot of face there where all those people who finally wanted to find out about your content couldn't actually get to your website. Um, and so there's a couple of easy plugins for that. Um, there's WordPress Super Cache, where I think it even comes with most default WordPress installations right now, but it comes in default in the off position, and so you have to go in there and do the three mouse clicks to turn it on, and then, but then once you've done that, um, you know, you're good to go for letting Reddit and Dig pour into your website and check out what you're talking about. All right, so that's pretty much everything I had. Um, I had some links that I could show off. There's a CSS optimizer. Um, that I mentioned earlier, and just some other cool links about, uh, you know, topics around HTML5 and WordPress especially. Um, but I think we're going to put these slides up on SlideShare or something like that so that everybody can look at them at their leisure later uh, when they want to read some of these blog posts or, uh, you know, copy that script from Remy Sharp about uh, using HTML5 in a way that's compatible with IE7 and IE8. Um, and, you know, some thankful links to the people who I ripped off those images from earlier, a list apart. <laughs> um, and you can check out their preview of HTML5, which um, if you got at all lost or confused when I was talking about the semantic tags earlier, um, they do a really, really good description of kind of what they mean, how they should be used, and uh, what they're going to be used for in the future. That would be really cool for anybody who wants to learn more about those tags. Any questions? Sure. Um. You're talking about the, the date and time tags over yeah. there. Can you use those but not have them display and have it so that the, yeah. the, the um, search engine can read them but you don't have to actually show the date and time on your site? Yep, so the way that like Nicholas does it here, he has this time, date time, 2009, 815. Um, and this can get more specific if you need it to be, like if you're on a kind of blog that updates multiple times yeah. a day. There's a standard where you can also put like the exact time of day and a time zone in there, um, or if you only care about like the day and the year, you can do that as well. Um, but then he he writes here August fifteenth, two thousand nine. If he didn't write that and just did time, date, time, that, and then the closed time tag, that would be fine as well. The search engines would see it fine, um, but it wouldn't actually print anything after the page. So it's not the kind of thing that would make search engines you know, mad. Like it's not a trick to search engines. No, not if you at don't all. Print it for the page. Not at all. Okay. Any other questions? How many search engines are indexing for HTML5? Um, I know Google and Bing and Yahoo are all at least looking at it. Um, I don't know about Ask or any of the other ones that are kind of the smaller players in the search market. But I know, you know the three that make up 90% you know, plus of search traffic definitely do. Great. I'm going to get off the stage now. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Thank you.